Algeria is famous for a lot of things. Algeria is famous for fighting off the French in the Algerian War of Independence. Algeria is also famous for being the biggest country in Africa as of the writing of this video. Algeria is famous for their own form of Arabic, which I've heard from other Arabic speakers is very confusing. Well, one thing about Algerian history that a lot of people don't know is that they went through a civil war throughout the 90s. But before we hop into the civil war, I gotta give you all the background information, so this might take a while. Algeria was a French colony until they had a huge war against France throughout the 50s. This war was called the Algerian War of Independence, and it would be a war for Algerian independence. Now one group that really spearheaded the War of Independence against France was the National Liberation Front, aka the FLN. It's a French acronym. And following the victory over France, Algeria would need a new government. The FLN would become the dominant and kind of only party within this new Algerian government. This is what some people would call a one-party state. Right after independence, the FLN and the Algerian government would begin to have a lot of internal conflicts. As FLN president Ahmed Ben Bella would find himself suppressing and fighting off FLN and also FFS rivals. Heads up now, I'm going to be oversimplifying a lot of Algerian presidents right now. Now, President Ahmed Ben Bella would enact land reforms. He would also open up relationships with other African nations. He would join the non-aligned movement and would also begin to enact socialist policies. But Ahmed Ben Bella would just have too many foes and he would be cooled in 1965 by his defense minister, Hurari Boudamin. As Ahmed Ben Bella was beginning to be seen as sporadic and more authoritarian within a one-party state. President Boudamin would continue the trend of socialism. Now one important thing President Boudamin would do is nationalize Algerian oil. This action would greatly improve the Algerian economy and also infrastructure. During his rule, you'd see the infrastructure of Algeria will improve. But presidents don't last forever and he would be succeeded by President Chadlik bin Jadid. President bin Jadid would come into power in 1979. Heads up again, I apologize about oversimplifying all these presidents. But now back to President Chadlik bin Jadid, who would begin to enact reforms within the Algerian government. He would begin to work on liberalizing the Algerian economy, and then the economy would kind of bomb, as Algeria would see the 1980s oil gold. Now, after researching what an oil gold is, I think it is when oil surplus are so high that the price of oil just begins to decrease. Due to the fact that Algeria was very dependent on its oil, the Algerian economy would begin to tank. Now for those that don't know, when Algerian oil was nationalized, Algeria would become a state that was able to maintain itself through its oil money. But the 1980s oil gold would open the floodgates of destroying the Algerian economy. As time went on, you would see a disintegration in the quality of life for Algerian citizens and an increase in corruption within the government. Unemployment would also rise, domestic agriculture qualities would also decrease, and the depletion of oil revenues would only make things worse for the Algerian government and people. The stated problems in the whole one-party state would lead to the creation and the popularization of opposition towards the government. Algeria throughout the late 1980s would begin to see protests and more political actions against the government. Now, most of all forms of debate and public disapproval towards the government was, um, we'll say halted or came into conflict with the government and the secret police. The mosque of Algeria, though, were left unscathed, well, compared to the other political parties. Due to this freedom, many mosques and imams would also begin to publicly disapprove of the actions and the handling of the government. Many of these supporters would later form and join the FIS, aka the FIS, which should actually be the ISF, but you guys already know French is a weird language and English is a superior one. Jokes aside, the FIS, or FIS, was an Islamist political party that would exponentially grow in Algeria's trying time. The FIS would proclaim that their solution to Algeria's problem was what they viewed as a return to Islam and the creation of an Islamic state. The FIS would have no problems antagonizing the government, viewing the FLN leadership and the whole government as incompetent, corrupt, and traitorous. Algeria was on the road to some form of political explosion. The environment of a one-party state, the failing economy, state repression, and corruption within the government would explode with the 1988 October riots. Massive protesting, rioting, and clashes with the police and army would spread across Algerian cities for six days. The youth of Algeria were tired of the political status quo and would begin to demand political change. The youth of Algeria would begin to clash with the armies. Clashes and the following military crackdown would shake Algeria to its core for six days. By the end of the week, reports of tortures and killings would begin to spread across the country. The FLN monopoly on power would be publicly challenged in a way it hasn't before. 
Here you would see steps towards ending the FLN control of the Algerian government. In response to the rioting, the government would amend the constitution, basically allowing other parties to be formed. During this time, the FIS would begin to work on the utopia they envisioned. Many FIS supporters would begin to wear hijabs, dobes, and grow beards. Crimes would also be confronted within FIS areas of support, as FIS supporters would begin to patrol the streets, punishing those they accused of committing crimes. The relationship between the FIS and the military would only continue to disintegrate if they already had one between each other in the 1990s. FIS supporters and the military would begin to clash between each other, especially when the FIS would hold general strikes in Algeria. FIS leader Abbas Madani and Ali Belhaji would be arrested by the military. But by the 1990s, local Algerian elections would be held. The FIS would win half of the communal assembly and half of the popular Waliyat assembly seats. The FIS was able to do this as many Algerians would abstain from voting and many Algerians would also view the FIS as the only party that could challenge the FLN control of the government. But this didn't guarantee an FIS victory in the coming general elections. But seeing these victories, the FIS would see a spike in support and would begin to continue with this spike to work on maintaining and increasing morale of FIS members and to, of course, gain more supporters. But even with the loss of two of their leaders, the morale of the FIS would bleed its way into the 1991 parliamentary elections. Now, this election would be done in two rounds, and to the surprise of the FLN, the FIS would win 47% of the votes compared to 23% that the FLN won in the first round of voting meaning that the FIS could win a two-thirds majority in the second round of voting and start changing the constitution. The Algerian military didn't like these odds, and the Algerian military would step in, practically cancelling the elections in Algeria, while President Chadlik bin Jadid would be forced to step down by the army. This is what some people would call a coup d'etat. How's my French now, huh? While exiled leader Mohamed Boudafa would return to Algeria and would become president with the backing of the army. Following the military coup, Algeria would be placed under a state of emergency and the FIS group would be banned in 1992. The Algerian military would begin to conduct mass arrests of suspected FIS members and leaders, with reports of torture and many FIS supporters being sent to internment camps in southern Algeria. The outrage of the military crackdown upon the FIS and the cancelling of the elections would radicalize FIS members and help propel the already armed underground Islamist groups to take up arms against the Algerian military if they weren't like already taking up arms. As you already had groups attacking the state, but cancelling the election and banning the FIS group would like really kick off the civil war. As many Islamists would begin to run for the mountains. Within these mountains, these groups were able to form camps and bases. This doesn't mean that the Algerian war was going to become a conventional war. The Algerian civil war would become a war of an insurgency against the state, as the insurgents would expect popular revolts. But when that didn't happen, the armed movements would remain underground. Now remember President Mohamed Boudafé? Well, he would have to walk a tightrope of not angering the army while also trying to usher in reforms within the government. His attempts were cut short in 1992 when he would be assassinated by one of his bodyguards on TV. Ali Kef would be placed as the chairman of the High Council of the State following the death of Mohamed Boudafé. Algeria would see a quick and deadly escalation of the civil war as the many insurgent groups would begin amassing, organizing, and arming each other up. Now, the Algerian military and government of course wasn't going to take this lying down and you would see two factions split. One were the conciliators who wanted to talk and integrate rebels within the government and you would have the eradicators who wanted to eradicate all these Islamist groups. During this time, the insurgent groups would also begin to attack Algerian government symbols of power, state institutions, and the military and police. The insurgency's manpower would only increase, but just like fighting in any war, fighting costs money. The insurgents would lead raids into military outposts, they would also begin to rob banks with the aim of supplying their struggle. But the demand of money would lead insurgents to begin enacting attacks upon civilians and partaking in illegal trading in the Algerian black market. These things, especially the taxing thing, is what people would call extortion. Algerian insurgent groups would also get funded from rich Islamists abroad. The Algerian government would also begin to see support, like from France. The Algerian army would begin to place Algerian cities under curfew and would begin rounding up suspected insurgents and supporters. This would lead to wide reports of tortures, disappearances, and executions. Now, the Islamists of Algeria were going to take this lying down and many disenfranchised FIS supporters and Islamists would go and drove to join these insurgent groups, especially the MIA. Now, the MIA's end goal was to force the Algerian government into negotiations and then from there put the FIS back into power. 
the MIA during the Civil War would also become the de facto arm of the FIS. And now before someone hits me over the head, yes I do understand that there are many insurgent groups within Algeria during the Civil War, but to be honest I just don't want to put a bunch of acronyms in here. But really jokes aside, the reason why I'm really talking about the MIA and not other groups is because the MIA was seen as a very huge group that was, was able to go against the government and was also able to take losses from the government. Now the MIA would be seen as one of the major insurgent factions that was leading the insurgency against the state. But the Islamists of Algeria weren't united. In 1993, you'll see the formation of a more hardline group that wanted to overthrow the Algerian government and form an Islamic state from its ashes. Many of these like-minded insertion groups would unite to form the GIA, also known as the Armed Islamic Group of Algeria. Um, for sure it sounds better in French or Arabic, but in English, it's not very creative. Now the GIA would be formed by Algerians who fought in Afghanistan against the Soviets. The Afghans as they were called would look down upon the FIS and MIA as being too moderate and not dedicated to the cause like themselves. Now the MIA and GIA would see splits over the end goal and the execution of this insurgency. Like I said the MIA wanted to force the government into negotiations and basically put the FIS back into power. The GIA on the other hand wanted to dismantle the whole Algerian government and just form an Islamic state. The two groups would also disagree on how to conduct the insurgency. The GIA compared to the MIA group was very loose and open to bombing anything that had the word government written on it, while the MIA and GIA would also compete against each other for fighters from the hotbed of disenfranchised FIS supporters. But even with the conflict of interest, the GIA and MIA would ramp up attacks against the Algerian military and police. But on top of that, the GIA especially would begin to attack and kill journalists, teachers, government workers, and anyone that they felt were going against them. The GIA would also conduct the Algiers airport bombing in 1993, which would kill 8 civilians and wound over 100. During this time in 1993, insurgents were able to harass government forces in major Algerian cities, as they were areas of support for the insurgents, and the insurgents wanted to also destabilize the state. And I mean destabilizing the capital of Algeria and other major Algerian cities would greatly help in their goals. By the end of 1993 and the start of 1994, Algeria would be suffering from an insurgency. The state of emergency would only extend and curfews would only spread across Algeria. Algeria would drive into insecurity and be engulfed by chaos. Algerian city blocks and flats would become battlegrounds between insurgent cells, government troops, and gangs. The GIA would also declare that any foreigner who hadn't left Algeria by December 1993 would be fair game. And the GIA is a group that would make empty promises. Now let me tell you guys about some secrets. The FIS and Algerian government would actually conduct secret peace talks between each other during these times. Within 1994, you'd also see the formation of pro-government militias called Patriots. They were used to control and dispute areas that the Algerian military couldn't control or dispute with the insurgents. But just like in many civil wars, when the government allows state militias to run around, reports of killing and general abuses of power will increase. Algeria was no different. Pro-government militias would begin to fight insurgent groups, but they would also begin to attack people that they suspected of supporting the insurgents that would partake in extortion and executions. The Algerian civil war would also see massive prison breaks. In March 10th, 1994, the Tauzut prison would be attacked by insurgents and the insurgents would free over 1,000 prisoners. But on the same day of the prison raid, playwriter Abdul Qadir Alua would be killed by insurgents. Once again showing how the Algerian citizen was caught in the middle between these two factions. As the insurgency continued, many insurgent leaders would also begin to defect towards the GIA. But you would still have many loyal MIA and MIA type groups. These groups would unite to form the Islamic Salvation Army. Now, the term Islamic Salvation Army had been used before, but like this time they would make it an official term so everybody knew this time they were legit. The AIS and the GIA would now find each other on a crash course towards conflict, as the AIS would denounce the GIA as being too extreme, while the GIA on the other hand would denounce the AIS as being nothing but a bunch of pushovers who can't really fight. The GIA would really say this because the FIS and the AIS were negotiating with the government at the time. The GIA would also begin to work on consolidating itself within Algerian cities. In December 1994, GIA gunmen would also hijack Air France 8969. 
This would become a notable thing in the Civil War, as the GIA would begin to take aim especially at French citizens in mainland France, as the French government supported the Algerian government during the Civil War. By 1994, Algeria would see steps towards peace with the Rome talks. Now these peace talks were spearheaded by Algerian opposition parties. Now within these talks they would include the Islamist FIS, the Socialist FFS, and FLN representatives. Now the aim of these talks were to reinstate democracy via parliamentary elections. They would also call for the repealment of the banning of the FIS party and a investigation into the Algerian army for human rights abuse along with the Algerian army pulling away from the political sphere within the Algerian government and a renewment of the constitution. This peace platform was looked down upon by both armed Islamist groups and denounced by the Algerian government as foreign meddling. Algeria would see a continuation of the civil war. In February 1995, you would also see the Sir Kedagi prison mutiny which would result in the death of over 100 Algerians. Now within 1995 and 1996, the GIA and the AIS would begin to come into conflict with each other, like actual shooting conflict not like disagreements. On a lighter note, the Algerian government would hold elections. 1997 would see Algeria enter a new breath of fresh air within the political process. Kind of. The civil war would also enter a new level of shock and horror. Algeria was already suffering from a very intense insurgency and from state repression. But these massacres were something completely new. Now the justification for these massacres committed by the GIA is that the GIA would kind of tuck fear a lot of people. Now for those that don't know what takfir is, in a very greatly oversimplified way, takfir is basically saying to someone, you're not a Muslim, and for whatever reason, you've now been takfired. A little bit of inner Muslim-like information here, um, throwing takfirs around is like very serious accusations to be thrown around, and the GIA, well, takfired a lot of people, as if you had to fight against the Algerian government as like a religious duty, and if you weren't fighting the Algerian government, then clearly you were not fulfilling your religious obligations and well, now you could be took feared. Now, massacres occurred before in the Algerian Civil War, like during the Sarkadegi prison mutiny, but 1997 would be the year in which massacres would peak during the war, and at times would just seem like completely random violent acts against the civilian population. At times, whole villages and neighborhoods would be targeted, and if no group claimed responsibility, then People would just assume that the attack was committed by the GIA, as the GIA would commit and claim responsibility for many of these massacres. The weapons and victims of the massacres even vary. In some massacres you had the usage of guns and in other massacres you had the usage of knives. While in the massacres, victims would be women, children, men, the old, the pregnant, and the young. And it didn't end in 1997. These massacres would continue into 1998 and 1999. The massacring policy committed by the GIA would begin to split many insurgents within the general insurgency but also within the GIA. But the Algerian government would also be drenched in controversy because in a good amount of massacres, Algerian military barracks and other military installations would simply be hundreds of meters away as these massacres would occur with no intervention from the military. Due to the handling of these massacres by the government, many theories would begin to be formed. Now, I try my best to not put theories into my video and just stick to things that happen. But these theories popped up in almost every source I looked at, so I have to address it. Now, the core principle of these theories is that the Algerian government would either commit or facilitate these massacres, while the GIA would also begin to see splits within the group over their whole massacring policy. The AIS would now find themselves fighting off the government in the whole ride or die fanatical GIA. In 1997, the AIS would declare a unilateral ceasefire, causing the civil war to become one between the GIA, GIA splinter groups, and the Algerian government. While in September 1997, Algerian president, I didn't write his name down on the script so it's just going to be on the screen, would step down from power, leading to presidential elections also being held. Now, the presidential elections was one between the opposition parties, who of course were competing with each other, but also with the old military guard Abdulaziz Bouteflik. As election night would come near though, opposition candidates would declare that they were quitting and dropping out of the elections as they felt that the Algerian military was meddling or preparing to meddle in the elections and were going to falsify the results. 
Due to these candidates dropping out, Abdulaziz Bouteflik, who was seen as like the old military guard, as a military-backed candidate, would win with 75% of the votes, thus making him the Algerian president. President Abdulaziz Bouteflik would also continue negotiations with AIS Group as the AIS Group would begin to work on trying to gain amnesty. By June 1999, the AIS Group would basically disband and all of their members would begin surrendering in mass to the government, or the government in return would begin to give amnesty. This would just leave the GIA and GIA splinter groups continue the fight against the government. And as the years went by, the GIA would slowly begin to be destroyed and would decline, as the GIA would be denounced by other Islamists, while the government would begin to conduct more and more operations against them. And when the war on terror would begin, the GIA group would be effectively destroyed by 2003. But the GIA splinter group, GSPC, which stands for this, would soldier on until pledging allegiance to Al-Qaeda in 2003. In 2005, Algeria would see the 2005 Reconciliation Referendum, which would give amnesty to fighters, unless if they committed rapes, massacres, or bombings. It would also ban Islamist rebels from rejoining the political sphere, and it would also provide money to family members who lost loved ones to the war. This referendum of reconciliation would be approved by the Algerian public where the GSPC would continue their insurgency against the state in southern Algeria. The GSCP would later become Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghrib. AQIM, like-minded groups, and the Islamic State now fight within the Maghrib, which has become a battleground between jihadist groups and well every country in the Maghrib. Along with this insurgency sucking in nations like the United States, the United Kingdom, and especially France. In my opinion, the insurgency in the Maghrib, as time goes on, would become one of the most intense battlegrounds in the war on terror. But we're not going to end this on a sad note. Algeria would see change with the political process. When the Arab Spring kicked off, Algeria too would, well, kick off. Protests would begin in 2010 to 2012. Algeria would also then again see protests with the Arab Summer. It's a very recent term which is used to describe protests happening within the Arab world very prime example would be Sudan. Oh, and also Algeria. These protests would begin in 2019, would call for the resignation of President Abdulaziz Bouteflik. President Bouteflik would drop his run for the presidency, going for a fifth term. But this stuff is getting like way too recent for my comfortness, so I'm just gonna end the video here. You guys should know by now, I don't know how to end videos correctly.